It's the final decisive weekend of the Tata Steel Chess Masters and in this video I'm going to show you the big game, the big clash between the two Indian prodigies, Gukesh, 17 years old, playing with the white pieces against Pragnananda, only 18 years old. These two kids, they know each other very well, they have played multiple times and in the near future they will definitely face each other even more. I would say these two guys are future world champions, but who knows? Let's see what's going to happen in this game first. I would like to make use of the opportunity to thank you all for the 4,000 subscribers and even more. Make sure to help me, the channel, to grow as we are not stopping here yet. Let's see what happens in uh, this game. Gukesh starts with the move d4. And after knight of 6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4. It's the Nimzo Indian opening. And Gukesh... Is not a guy who follows the, the main lines, he has his own ideas. I would say his openings are usually not the best, but he is definitely improving. And he goes for a very interesting line. He played here the move knight of three, developing the knight, and after castling, he goes for bishop g5, pinning the knight on f6, and black plays here the main move c5, putting pressure against the pawn on d4. So this is the first interesting moment of the game, as white needs to decide here how he is going to deal with this tension between the two pawns. Well, Gukesh decides here to advance the pawn to d5, grabbing space in the center. Black takes on d5, white takes back, and black goes for the move d6. Now we have a structure we know from the Benoni, but in the Benoni, usually the bishop, which is now on b4, it's placed on g7 so that it exerts pressure on this uh, long diagonal here. The bishop is on b4 and it does exert pressure against the knight on c3. Different dynamics, let's see how it works out. White goes for the move e3, a modest move, but placing the pawn on e4 it's not really going to work out because black can easy, easily just uh, generate some play against that pawn because of the pin. So black has a different plan. Plays here the move h6, bishop h4, and now Normally you just try to get your knight to d7. It's one of the main continuations. Another very sensible move here is to get the bishop out to f5 first so that white cannot just place the bishop on d3 himself. Well, anyway, that happened in the game. But now after this bishop takes d3, queen takes d3, it will be easier for black to complete its development. Now the knight goes out to d7 and all the minor pieces have left the back rank, you can just move the queen and then the rooks will be connected. I would say black is quite comfortable here, but it's just a game. Also white is not doing badly here at all. Castling king side, rook e8. And now Gukesh comes up with a very interesting, unusual plan. He plays here the move, knight e2. He's moving the knight away from c3. And you can ask yourself, what is this knight going to do? I would like to counter the question by asking what is the bishop doing on b4 here. It can no longer take the knight on c3. It's basically standing on an empty diagonal. White can just ignore the bishop. And I would say the bishop is just out of play there. Let's see what this knight can do later on. Various options. Now in Benoni structures like this one, you normally see that black is going to try to use its queenside majority. And therefore, Prak goes for the move a6 getting ready to play b5 very soon. But first, Gukesh plays this move, queen f5. Lot of pressure against the knight on uh, f6. But okay, everything is still defended at this point. Black has different ways to, uh, to proceed here. I like a move like queen e7, so that uh, at some point maybe you want to offer the exchange of uh, queens. That's one idea. But first, black played here the move c4. And now white immediately attacks the pawn on uh, c4 with the move rook a c1. And you would expect here black to go for the move b5. I think that's a good move. But it was not played in the game. And instead the move rook c8 was played. And this is inaccurate I would say. Because white can play the move a3 now. Questioning the bishop on b4. And the big difference between the moves rook c8 and b5 is that here the bishop cannot go to c5 as it hangs the pawn on c4. The bishop has to go back to a5 so that the rook protects the pawn along the c-file. But white continues its attacking ideas with the move knight g3. 
The pieces are looking very nicely on the king side. And moves like g5, well, they're really weakening. They're inviting peace sacrifices. And the knight will very soon come to f5 as well. That's something you don't really want to play. Black instead played here the move queen e7. And now there are various interesting moves. And Gukesh also came up with an interesting move, but not the best one. Because apparently a very strong move here that I really want to show it to you is the move b4. You're attacking the bishop. Taking the pawn en passant is not a good idea because it does run into bishop takes knight. And you have a huge problem. If you take with the knight back, then it's rook takes c8, white is winning a rook as the queen protects the rook. If you take back with the queen, well, then the knight is hanging on d7. So black would be forced to take with the pawn. But then, for instance, a move like knight h5 with idea to go queen g4, or queen g7 with mating ideas is just game over. So after b4, you cannot take en passant. You would have to move the bishop away. But then the pawn is really vulnerable. For instance, something like knight d2 attacking the pawn. And after c3, you put a knight on e4. Very annoying pin, and also the pawn on c3 is just hanging. This is almost winning for white. Well, it was not played in the game. Gukesh had his ideas also ready. He went for the move queen h3. This may look strange at first, but the idea is very clear. After rook c5, black attacks the pawn on d5. Now the knight can come into f5, attacking the queen, and the queen also got to keep the pawn on d6 defended. So queen f8 was played, but now it's rook fd1, protecting the pawn on d5. And this pawn on d5 cannot really be taken. If you take with the rook, you can swap everything. And then at the end of the line, the knight on d7 is unprotected. And with the move knight takes h6, you do win back your pawn. And black's position is just falling apart. So many weaknesses in that case. So black is not going to take the pawn on d5. Instead, there follow the move bishop d8. Offering a to the knight on f6. But now the rook comes into d4, attacking the pawn on c4. Very nice attacking play. And uh, still, pawn on d5 cannot be taken because of the basically the same variation as we discussed. And also, what should black do? Black's position is quite cramped. The queen cannot move because of the knight on f5. If you try to kick the knight away with g6... Well, there's bishop takes f6 first. If you take back now, it's knight takes h6. White is winning a pawn and this looks, uh, looks very bad. So black instead decided here to play the move b5, protecting the pawn on c4. And now white played the move bishop g3, hitting the pawn on d6 one more time. Black interferes with a knight on e5. And now rook cd1, the pawn on d5 needs to be overprotected. And you don't have to be concerned about knight takes f3. You can just take back with the pawn. And the knight on e5 is very important for black as it does prevent white from capturing the pawn on d6. Black played here knight h7. So the idea is to, um, to try to initiate the exchange of uh, minor pieces with a move like knight to g5. Well, there are various interesting continuations. Bishop f4 was played. And here the move knight g5 was played by Pragnananda. Taking the queen, taking on g5 doesn't make much sense. It uh, just allows h takes g5 and black kind of entangles by trading off some uh, pieces. It really helps black to get out of that cramped uh, situation. So white instead play the move queen g3. Attacking the knight with three pieces. Now it's time to take on f3 and g takes f3. This is not a weakening of white's king's position. You can always move the king away, try to get your rook over to the g-file. Very interesting position with a lot of attacking potential for, uh, for white. Black needs to deal with threats against the pawn on g7 and the pawn on h6. For instance, white is intending to take here. So king h7 was played. And what should be played here? Well, in fact, Gukesh found a very interesting idea. But he played it in the wrong move order. He played here the move queen h3. But better is to play the move rook e4 to attack that knight on e5. That knight cannot go away because then the pawn on d6 is hanging. For instance, if you uh, play something like bishop f6, well then queen h3 with similar ideas as in the game. 
But this is a very important uh, move order because after the move played in the game, Queen H3, Black has uh, still some uh, ideas. He, he wants to move the knight away to g6, but it runs into bishop takes d6, as I said. So that's not good. Bishop e7 was played here. And now the move rook to e4. So the big difference is that if white would have started with rook e4, bishop e7 is not possible. There is bishop takes e5. And after d takes, queen takes e5, black's position is collapsing. So after queen h3, bishop e7, rook e4, this is the game. Here, black has ideas to get out of this uh, pressure. And um, well, in the game, they follow the move rook d8, but probably a very strong move here is knight d3 to uh, attack the bishop, look for counterplay against the pawn on uh, b2. I guess that Puck didn't go for this line because of knight takes e7. If you take back, there's bishop takes d6 with a very annoying pin, but knight takes f4, attacking the queen is a good move. And if you uh, give a check here first, then well, it's knight g6 and black is absolutely uh, okay here. Was not played. Rook d8 on the board, so black stays very passive. And there are still a lot of possibilities. I think Prague was counting here on bishop takes e5. And if you take back, well, you're not winning material here. Rook takes e5, bishop f6, black is absolutely all right. The rook on e5 is kind of stranded. If you take on e7 first, you're going to win a pawn with a double attack. Check. You can take on e5, but after the queens are getting swapped, in something like this, black is absolutely okay. Has ideas to generate counterplay. Black should be able to hold because of that weak pawn on uh, d5. It's not really getting anywhere. So white is not going to take on e5. Once you have the initiative, there's pressure. You don't want to release the tension here. So king g2 played. But now, okay, Prague finally could have gone with his knight to g6. Knight g6 not played in the game. I think he didn't want to play it because of rook takes e7. And after rook, knight takes... Bishop takes d6, looks like you're winning back a lot of material, but with the move, rook takes d6, knight takes d6, and now, for instance, a move like f5 with the idea to go queen f6, to attack the knight, to win the pawn back on d5, black is absolutely still in the game. But Puck didn't want to move its knight away. He played the move a5, looking for counterplay in time trouble. But here there are a lot of interesting possibilities. White played the move, rook dd4, bringing another rook into the attack. But still, there is knight g6 as a possibility. So if we go back one move, better idea for white is to eliminate that annoying knight first. After d takes e5, now you can push the pawn to d6. And there are so many incredible tactics here. If you take on d6, it's rook g4 threatening to take on g7. Now the bishop cannot defend on f6. That's why we play the move d6 to deflect the bishop. If you do play g6, it's knight takes h6, opening the h file. If black takes the knight, it's queen h4 winning the queen. We should understand that now around move 30, the players were very low on time. And that explains the drama which is happening at the board. Rook dd4 played in the game. Black went for the move c3, pawn takes c3, rook takes c3. And still a lot of Interesting possibilities. White went here for this move. Rook takes e5. Exchange sacrifice. Pawn takes rook. Bishop takes e5 with the idea to take on g7. And then you're attacking the queen. You're hitting the pawn on h6 with mating idea. So even if you play something like g6, the simplest move is bishop g7. Threatening queen takes h6 and to take the queen. This should just be winning for white. So that's not gonna work for black. Black instead played here the move f6 to attack the bishop. You would expect the bishop to move, but Buck overlooked this resource, d6, ignoring the bishop on e5, setting up a new threat against the bishop on e7. After pawn takes bishop, it's d takes e7, attacking the queen, attacking the rook. White is completely winning here. So Buck had to give up the bishop. And now after bishop takes d6, white is having a knight and a bishop against the rook. It's completely winning for white. But let's see what happens. Queen f7. Rook to g4. Intending to take on g7, for instance. And now rook g8. Here, 
Gukesh goes for bishop f4. And he is looking for a way to break through on the king side with the point that if you take the pawn on a3, for instance, it's knight takes h6, opening the h file. If you take the knight, it's queen takes h6 with checkmate. So, of course, black overprotects the pawn on h6. Queen f8, bishop d6 back, just attacking the queen, protecting the pawn on a3. The queen goes back to f7, bishop f4. He's trying the trick again, queen f8, but now it's move 40 and you need to reach the time control. And what did Gukesh play here? He went for this move, bishop d6. And Puck was looking at the board. He stopped the clock, called the arbiter and said it's a free fold repetition because indeed he made a correct claim. If Black would play here the move queen f7, the position has been repeated three times. And that's just a dramatic end of the game. Something which happens at amateur level, it happened to me at least once in a classical game. When I had a winning position, I just repeated one time too many. And it also happens to a future world champion. This is absolutely incredible. Gukesh just wanted to repeat the position one more time to reach the time control, get a bonus of 50 minutes to think over how to convert this advantage. But he just didn't um, recollect the, the position uh, correctly and therefore he uh, repeated too many times. Just very sad end to a, to a fascinating game. Let's have a look how this could have uh, ended. If white continues with rook h4, then you have ideas to take on h6 at, at the right moment. For instance, rook takes a3, runs into bishop d6. So this pawn on a3 cannot be taken by the rook. If you take with the queen instead, well, you would love to take with the rook on h6 and after g takes h6, take with the queen. But the problem is that black is giving a check first. So there is not a forced win here yet for, uh, for white. You can try to do something to, uh, to block the g-file, to try to get your queen in, for instance. That's one good idea. Another good idea is to play knight d6, threatening to take on uh, b5 with a knight fork. If you go queen c5, also stopping the, the check on, um, on f5. Then it's queen d7 as a possibility. And step by step, the white pieces are just penetrating into uh, black's position. This looks, looks just really bad. For instance, h5, knight f5, intending to, uh, to take here. I should say that after queen d7, the main threat, of course, is rook takes h6. The pawn on g7 is pinned. That's why h5. But after knight f5, you're threatening to take the h pawn anyway. King to g6, for instance, and now rook takes h5. This is just a nice way to finish off the game. Queen f7, check. King can't go anywhere. g6, queen h7. But this is the problem. You're looking for a forced way to finish off the game. And you don't see it, but basically any move would have done the job. And well, because of this result, and also the fact that Fidit managed to defeat Abdul Sator of the tournament leader, we're going into the final round with five players in the shared uh, lead. That's absolutely incredible. Uh, Gukesh is there, Abdul Satorov, Vaihi, um, also Fidit is there, and of course Anish uh, Giri is also among the players with, um, with a very good chance to win the tournament. Behind it, it's Pragnananda and Firusha. They have a theoretical chance uh, still to win the event also. But let's see what's going to happen in the final round of the Tata Steel Chess Masters. Make sure to like this video, to subscribe, and let me know what you think of this game in the comments. Thanks for doing that. See you soon. Bye-bye.